Okay, good afternoon. I am calling our meeting of July 25, 2023 to order at 3.32. Um, roll call vote, Rosie. Trustee Anderson. Here. Trustee Crane. Here. Trustee Wigand. Here. Trustee Pearson. Here. Trustee Murphy. Here. Trustee Ursoyland. Here. Trustee Bartow. Here. Dr. Smith. Here. And next we will adopt the agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Wigand. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Okay. Do we have any community input items? None. No. Okay. All right. Um, we will go to closed session in a moment. The items for closed session are 4A, conference with legal counsel, potential litigation, one case. 4B, conference with legal, legal counsel, anticipated litigation, one case. 4C, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, one case. 4D, conference with labor negotiator. And 4E, public employee dismissal, discipline release, or employment, and we will. We are now going to close session at 3:33, and we will return to open session at 6 p.m. Okay. Open session portion of our meeting for July 25, 2023 to order. And for our opening ceremonies, the time is 6.02. And for our opening ceremonies, um, can we please have Trustee Bartow lead us in a moment of reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance? Place your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next, we will adopt the minutes from the meetings um, in July, July 20, 2023, and or June 2023, and July 17, 2023. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, moved by yeah. Trustee Wigan, seconded by Trustee Ursulu. Yes. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Okay, great. Next, we have the intro introduction of new staff. Is this Dr. Sir that will be introducing our new staff? <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading, <laughs> reading what I'm going to say. So we are so excited to introduce tonight uh, three of our newest uh, principals at our sites. And I'm going to begin one at a time, share a little bit about them, and then they'll come up to the podium. So I'd like to first introduce Dr. Joe Urban, who will be joining us at Adam. <laughs> Dr. Irvin comes to us from Orange, where he was a director of innovation, but he shared that he was homesick and wanted to go back to sites. And so we're happy to have him. He's been a science teacher at magnet schools. He's raised SBAC scores in math and English language arts. And he also has created arts programs. So we're really excited to the talent he'll bring to Adams and the talent he'll bring to our entire district. Dr. Irvin. Thank you so much. Good evening, Board President Anderson, Board Members, Superintendent Smith, and members of the community. I am honored to have the opportunity to serve the Adams Elementary community as their new principal, becoming the newest Adams All-Star. Throughout my career as a prior science teacher, assistant principal, principal, and executive director, I have focused on student engagement. A prior colleague coined the phrase, what matters to you matters. I have carried this mantra with me in each position I've had. When students are engaged and have choice at school, their interest level increases. This increase in engagement results in better attendance, increased achievement, and building of new collaborative learning skills. The key is finding what engage each student. Robotics, the arts, science, 
I will build on the great things going on at Adams and look forward to developing collaborative relationships with the students, families, and staff of Adams Elementary. I want to thank my colleagues, my family for their support, as well as the Newport Mesa leadership team for their trust to serve the Adams community. I look forward to opening the 2023-24 school shortly. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have our CSCA. Oh, no, no, representative. we have oh, two more. more. Oh, 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 Sorry oh, about yeah. that. My apologies. Yeah, we, we have a full, full house today. Great. We have, uh, we'd love to introduce someone who's been around, but it has a new position. Alice Formanak will be joining us at College Park as the new principal. We have seen Alice and her talents at Whittier, where she has served as assistant principal. She is a leader in instruction. She is a leader in building culture and supporting staff and families. And so we're very excited to bring this expertise she's built in immersion program to College Park and, and apply that there. And uh, without further ado, Alice. Hello. <laughs> Good evening, board members, um, you know, Superintendent Smith, cabinet members, thank you for inviting me today to introduce myself. Um, I've got a long history in Newport Mesa, as um, Ms. Shields was, was saying. I actually taught in for, at Adams Elementary for 14 years. I just told that to Joe if, in case he needs a little background. Um, in the Estancia zone, and then I moved to assistant principal in the Newport Harbor zone, and now I'm going to be given this great opportunity as principal in the um, in the Costa Mesa zone. So I only have one more zone left to conquer. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very excited for the opportunity to con continue working with the students, the staff, the amazing families here in my new role. Um, I actually met with my PTA president and vice president just this week, and we're already brainstorming and planning a bunch of great events at College Park. So look out for those for this school year. So I just want to say thank you so much for giving me this great opportunity, and I look forward to working with you this year. Thank you, Alex. Welcome. And the last principal, what? Alice, do you want to acknowledge your family if they're in the house? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make this a win-win for everybody. I just, I just sat down and I was like, oh my gosh, my family. <laughs> <laughs> So I have uh, my son, Blake, he's seven, my daughter, nine, um, my sister and my husband, I, I won't mention Aww. their name, or their ages, <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for supporting me. Yes. No, thank you. The district. We are about families. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we're so proud to introduce Lorena Rubio, who will be the principal at um, Wilson. Thank you. And what is so beautiful about this, and some people might not know, is she began in our district. She lived here. Her career in education started here. It's really coming back full circle, and we're so excited to have her talents with us at Wilson and within the district. So without further ado. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President Anderson and um, board, board trustees. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. Mm -hmm. Superintendent Wes um, Smith, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's that night. I know, and I just that. <laughs> <laughs> Executive cabinet, colleagues, and community members, and family, and my family also here. So I'm very excited, very true. If I can tell you my little story, since I didn't write something because they said to be quick, but I did start here in Newport Mesa. Uh, I started at uh, Monta Vista, I don't know if you remember, so I'm going to date myself here, but it's, it's a beautiful experience I had here. So Monta Vista, then they closed down. Then I went to Lindbergh, they closed down. Oh, wow. <laughs> then I went to Kaiser Elementary. I went to Big Kaiser, if you remember yeah. that. And then my, little, my sisters went to Woodland, which was known as um, Little Kaiser. So I had great experiences here. I am so glad to be back. I was in the bilingual education. I am a I, success product from New Mesa, so it is very exciting. It is awesome to be back here to give back, and that is my why, you know, building those relationships to give back to the community. So I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity to be back here and make a difference. I'm very excited to be a wild cat. So <laughs> we are kind, I heard, and so I'm just very pumped up to see. I've already been on the campus for two days. Amazing people, 
there's amazing work happening at Wilson, and I'm just very excited to be part of it and bring out more amazing on it. And I do want to thank my family for joining me here today. So I have Isabella <laughs> Rubio. She is uh, 16, a senior. And I have uh, Elena Rubio. She is a senior at UCI. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, my husband, uh, David Rubio. He's just a uh, senior. <laughs> 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 I, I have my daughter Madeline she is actually a preschool teacher and she's working at this time and she would have loved to have been here so again thank you for your trust and I look forward to just having you come and visit us too so thanks again and have a great evening thank you very much okay now we will do our CSCA representative Eleanor Rebar Good evening, President Anderson, Cabinet, board, school board members, uh, Superintendent Smith. Uh, Stu Tedford, CSEA President, and three other e-board members and six other classified employees are at conference in Reno this week. Mm -hmm. So that's why he could not speak. And I wanted to acknowledge um, item 16C7. The res uh, resignation and retirement of some classified employees. Mm -hmm. We have a nutrition services retiring after 16 years. Um, Kathleen Hedges, confidential, after 13 years. Mm -hmm. We have a custodian after 21 years. And we have another custodian, Milt McCord, 48 years. Wow. And also Kent Ramsier, our energy manager, is retiring after 20 years. I have worked with Kent for the 20 years, and he'll be sorely missed. So that's our report. Thank you. Thank you. Next, NMFT President Rhonda Reed. Good evening, President Anderson, trustees, Superintendent um, Smith. I almost said last two, um, <laughs> cabinet and guests here tonight. Um, I <clears throat> heard many years ago, it was a warning really. The older you get, the faster time goes by. And so <laughs> fast forward, in my mind that was a true statement because it really just seems like we were just talking about graduation. In about three weeks for certificated and two weeks for counselors, they'll be returning to start another school year. So going by too fast. Um, we wanna thank our teachers that gave up a chunk of their summer to provide um, enrichment and instruction, remediation for our students. This summer, a couple of the officers um, went to an intense CFT training conference. Loads of good information. The location of the conference was right by Universal Studios. So, yes, we did go. But <laughs> after the conference, but every day, the, um, I'm going to say this wrong, the, I want to call them screenwriters, Writers Guild of America. They were out every morning and just protesting their, or striking really, and letting their voices heard that they want a fair wage. So the last day of the conference, um, some of CFT and NMFT joined them, and they were so truly touched that educators would be interested and support them by walking alongside of them. So also this summer, NMFT members Tamara and I joined CFT, UTLA, our state superintendent, the Cal Labor Fed leader, in supporting P Pasadena Art Center College with its challenge as a newly formed union to get a fair contract and really just to negotiate fairly. So we hear about, NMFT hears other unions and their challenges with their district. And it just makes us exceedingly thankful and grateful to you, President Anderson, trustees, and Superintendent West. We'll continue to work on our collaborative 
um, relationship. As we get closer to the start of school, we're looking forward to the exciting opportunity to welcome our new employees. So with that, I thank you. Thank you. Next, we have community input on non-agendized item. Trustee Weigand. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the closed session agenda only. Comments on closed session items are limited to... Different script. Different script. Excuse me about that one. Let me look. Oh. Sorry. This is the opportunity for the public to address the board uh, regarding items not on the regular agenda meeting. Comments on non-agenda topics are limited to three minutes per comment up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person by order of the Brown Act section 54954.2. The board will take no action nor have any discussions on non-agendized items. The superintendent may provide clarifications during superintendent's comments. Great. We have two, two out of three or four more trustees. We will start with Charlene Matoye. <laughs> Good evening, President Anderson, board, Dr. Smith, cabinet, and guests. I'm here in my role as personnel commissioner and wanted to brag on our district because it's a wonderful thing when we listen to the problem and start making solutions. We have now raised our cover positions from one to seven in the classified realm. What a cover position is, it's not quite a substitute, it's more of an on-call person who can go where they're needed, and it's a full-time position, so we have them at the ready. And I wanted to give you a little update. These seven job categories are 19 positions, so that's exciting. Right now we have four health assistant covers. All of those positions are filled. We have three instructional assistant behavior intervention positions that was just posted, so we don't have them filled yet. Fingers crossed. We have two instructional assistant early learning positions, early learning cover positions. They're filled. We have one instructional assistant special education cover. That's filled. We have three school bus drivers. That cover position was our initial cover position. All three of those are full. We have two nutrition service assistants, two, which means secondary and those are both filled. We have four nutrition service assistant covers, one for elementary. We have none filled, but we just recently raised that position from 3.75 hours to 6.5 hours, which means benefits and a whole day's work. So we are anticipating that being filled soon. And that means we are working hard in the classified realm. Since July, we have had 51, since July 1st this year, 51 classified positions processed. 30 have been signed, sealed, and delivered. 19 are pending, and two said thank you, but we're doing something else. So we know the numbers will keep coming in, and I just wanted to give you a mini report, and holding me to three minutes is amazing. <laughs> thank you very much, and I am proud of all the work that we're doing. And I made it two. Thank you. Okay, um, next is Wendy Lees. Good evening, uh, President Anderson and members of the Newport Mesa Unified School Board, Dr. Smith. Um, yes, I'm former trustee, 1994 to 02. So, um, you know, uh, we all, I was just doing my reports for the kids that I teach at College Hospital. And um, as I was doing each one, and they're all different, you know, just thinking how much I care for the patient, their patients, so they come and go, and many times I don't see them again. So I know that you're invested and you really care about if we're at 18,000 kids um, in this district. But you know from hearing the stories how COVID and the, just the isolation has affected our kids and, and their mental health. 
So I'm asking you to uh, do whatever it takes to open the schools that are closed, like Whittier and College Park, for the community. That um, <coughs> whatever it takes, bless you, for um, a security patrol to hire them so that um, it, they drive around at night and maybe deter would-be vandals or people that are, you know, hiding out in the corridors. I just think it's really important that these, this public property that, that the community has paid for and that it's green space and it's got playgrounds, that rather than have it all locked up every night, that it's open. And, and it's not rocket science. If we hadn't had COVID and, and we're seeing the downside, the effects in, in kids' mental health, and, and um, I see it in my part-time job. But people have asked you before, I appreciate what you did working with the city on Harper to come to an agreement, at least have, that, have a gate. But it's, it's not that hard to do to find the money and the, to open these part these schools for kids to play soccer, uh, you know the city opened the baseball field right there at Anaheim and 18th. It had been kind of closed off, and and people said no, we need to open it. So please put that on your list of things to do. Make it a priority. Um, you know, use the tick funds to uh, find the money for the security guards. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we have Portia Fisher. Hello, good evening, board and president and superintendent. This is super quick, and I'm sad that the new principal at Adams just left, but um, I live across the street from Adams, and when we walk our dogs in the evenings, we hear that the air conditioning it was going full blast, and in fact, the unit is sometimes frozen over, and no one's there in the summer, so it feels like a really big waste of energy. I don't know if that's just something that I know it's not really the board's job, but I was here, so I thought I would just throw that out there. If you guys could just check or tell our new principal to check that out, and I will say, in relation to um, when Lisa's comment, Adams is opened in the evenings and the mornings on weekends, and it is absolutely a gift the neighborhood uses it all the time kids that are all different ages and they're out there and it's beautiful so I would second that as well thank you thank you and next we have achievement dr. Torres Okay, thank you. We're going to have superintendent's <laughs> comments next. We don't have to. Yeah, yeah we're going to. Thank thank you. You. Strike that right away. Um, classified coverage, again, celebrating our classified and certificate employees, um, both over overwhelmed, uh, understaffed in some areas. So to have that coverage is significant. Thank you to the Personnel Commission for, for doing that. I, I, I would just thank Wendy Lease as well for calling out mental health. It's nothing more important to our parents right now than the safety and health of their, their students, and they identify post-COVID that mental health is our number one concern. I would compliment this board for prioritizing whole student supports because it addresses mental health first. As they say, and all the brain research can't teach algebra, the students going through trauma. Address the trauma, deal with the algebra. So um, Wendy couldn't agree more. Uh, with regard to the green space, kind of a uh, in the weeds uh, issue, but here, here's the good news. Um, you know, we have agreements with our cities. We love those agreements. We work collaboratively to provide uh, appropriate space for the community. Um, it has to be safe and it has to be uh, sanitary. Uh, but we're working with the community, um, especially in Costa Mesa, on making that space available and doing so safely. And they've been responding. Uh, they've been helpful in that regard. We have a meeting with them this week, and so we'll, we'll lift up that same issue with them because legally that property is theirs when school is not in session. Um, and I know they have an interest, as you expressed, to make that available. The city manager has been amazing. The city council has been amazing. So I, I think the future is bright in that regard. 
thank you for bringing that up. And air conditioning, we'll check it. Um, while the board really doesn't get involved in air conditioning, the person who does, I'm his boss. <laughs> They're my boss. So in the end, it really does kind of work out. But I saw Jeff taking notes. Yeah, we can't let it go off altogether because then it costs too much to cool it down. But, th but there is a sweet spot where it shouldn't be running unnecessarily. Other uh, community members have let us know that. And we've been able to make some improvements. We'll do it again at Adams where we can. So thank you for that. And that's the end. Thank you. And next, we'll do community input on agendized item. Clerk Wigan. Okay. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on agenda items are limited to three minutes per comment, up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. Speaker cards for items on the discussion action calendar may be held until that item is considered by the board if the speaker prefers. We have a variety of comments, so we are going to do two minutes. We'll start with Wendy Boyd. You may do it now, or you can do it before the item if you would choose. Can I go after? Just going, um, you can go now, or you can go when the item is on the agenda. Yeah, so I'll just wait till okay. Haley hey. Jenkins. Two com. I see. I have only have one topic. I don't have a second one. Ah. Um, do you want to do one of them now or do you want to wait for both? I'll wait till you get to the Okay. Portia Fisher? I guess I'll wait too. Okay. Raina Shabasta? Great. Lynn Riddle? Oh, wait. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wendy Lee. Right. All right. Okay. Now we will do achievement. Dr. Torres. Thank you, President Anderson. Um, in the spirit of the ongoing commitment to ensure that we're focusing on student achievement, um, we bring to you tonight a presentation on the secondary instructional coach model that we have implemented. Um, and I'd like to welcome up at this time our Director of Teaching and Learning, uh, Keith Carmona. He's going to be presenting to us tonight. Good evening, President Anderson, trustees, Superintendent Smith, and Executive Cabinet. Tonight, I'm here to share with you about the wonderful work that our secondary instructional coaches are engaged in at each of our campuses. This is a program that has been in place for a number of years and continues to evolve based upon our changing needs. Currently, we have a group of highly effective teachers serving in this capacity, and we feel compelled to share with you about the good work that they're doing. So what exactly is an instructional coach? Instructional coaches are highly effective classroom teachers that support our students by providing quality instructional leadership. They exist at each of our secondary campuses and are positively influencing our teachers and students on a daily basis. The instructional coach program, its goals and the work that these outstanding individuals do seeks to support board priority number one. As you will see, our instructional coaches are developing professional development opportunities, coaching teachers, and seeking to improve instruction on their sites for the stated purpose of improving academic performance for all students and returning to and surpassing pre-pandemic level standardized testing measures. First, I would like to share with you about the various roles that an instructional coach takes on. It is worth noting that each of these coaches have defined their roles slightly differently tailoring their support specifically to site needs. Our instructional coaches serve as a liaison between district and school site, 
co-create aligned professional development trainings, collaborate with school administration on coaching, instruction, leading PD, and building teacher capacity. They deliver PD sessions to all staff, and they serve as model or exemplar teachers. Here we have just a few pictures of our instructional coaches in action. On the left is a training taking place at Costa Mesa High School. And on the right is one being conducted by T. Winkle instructional coach Jackie Washington. One of the most powerful and beneficial ways to develop teacher capacity is through facilitated collaboration. Our instructional coaches are adept at leading teachers in the process of articulating and planning out instructional units and implementing new strategies. The articulation that our instructional coaches engage in also includes conversations during the transition years, particularly from middle to high school. We also will be focusing this year on the cross articulation between disciplines at the secondary level. Working with our teachers in a one-on-one -on -one basis is a highly effective way to impact our campuses. Because our instructional coaches have rapport with staff, they're able to leverage their trust with their colleagues to provide feedback, give insight, and support teachers in a very hands-on way. I'd like to share a few more details about the structure of our instructional coach arrangement. Each of the secondary schools have three instructional coaches. These individuals have one period during the day where they are not teaching, but they are tasked with the responsibilities I just previously mentioned. It is important to note that they are teaching most of the day. This enables them to stay fresh and current, as well as serve as a model for, the, for our staff for the instructional uh, strategies that we're focusing on. One coach at each site does take more of a technology focus and supports our teachers with the integration of new tools. These are all very high caliber teachers selected by our principals through an interview process and they represent content areas across the campus. The variety is quite beneficial. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have had this model of instructional coaches in Newport Mesa for some time. Initially, the goal was to help usher in the Common Core standards and at that time, they served that purpose quite well. Once that had taken place, we made the intentional decision to move the focus of the role to a more site-specific uh, focus where each campus was able to develop their own instructional initiatives. However, after COVID, we recognized the need to take a district-aligned approach to responding to the learning gaps that were established during the pandemic, and we brought the instructional coach focus back to a district-led program, which is what I'm describing to you this evening. The main work that our instructional coaches have done during the past several years is to be the stewards of secondary education's instructional priority, a listening and responding to student thinking. This has been our consistent instructional focus since the 21-22 school year and continues to be now. While eliciting and responding to student thinking, or ERST as it is sometimes called, has been the focus, we have parsed it out each year. During the first year, our instructional coaches trained and coached teachers on the eliciting aspect of it, teaching and modeling strategies to increase student voice in the classroom, particularly for our at-risk students. Last year, we moved the work forward to the responding to student thinking aspect of ERST, where teachers were learning to give quality feedback to students. This year, under the umbrella of eliciting and responding, we are focusing on idea building, where we will be empowering teachers to have their students think deeply about complex topics. The decision to focus on eliciting and responding to student thinking was not selected by accident. As we've talked about since the height of the pandemic, sadly, our kids quickly discovered how to become passive learners it became our imperative to engage our students in new and dynamic ways. Eliciting and responding to student thinking was born out of that need. So how do we do that work? Translating a district focus into intentional practice in the classroom. That's where the role of the instructional coach is critical. They are the ones helping to ensure the alignment of instructional approaches, the creation of PD sessions, and collaborating with our educational research and consultant partners. And this is all accomplished through monthly meetings where we both construct plans for the future and reflect upon our progress. In order for all of that to work, all of our teams must be working together. The secondary educational service staff, led by Ms. Torres and supported by me, Dr. Shaka, 
work in tandem with our TOSAs and these instructional coaches who support secondary teachers directly, who in turn positively influence our students. While I'm passionate about the work that our instructional coaches do, perhaps the best way to understand their impact is to hear from one of our own. At this time, I'd like to introduce Stevie Fuller, a math teacher and instructional coach at Costa Mesa High School, who will share from a personal perspective the value of, her, of the role and her experience as an instructional coach. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Stevie Fuller, as mentioned. Um, I'm going into my eighth year of teaching overall, my sixth year at Costa Mesa High School, and my second year as an instructional coach. Um, just to give you a background, six years ago when I joined this district, we were going through a piloting process in math um, for illustrative mathematics. That year, I went to upwards of, I don't know, six or eight pull-out days of professional development going over the curriculum. And within that curriculum are embedded instructional strategies authored by a researcher at Stanford named Jeff Swears. Um, a couple years later, when the instructional coaches adopted this model of eliciting and responding to student thinking, they recruited none other than Jeff Swires to help with those instructional practices. Um, so having a couple years under my belt of trying these practices in my own classroom with my own students and experiencing a lot of success, I wanted to throw my hat in the ring um, and become an instructional coach myself. So this past year, I've been helping the district-wide uh, ICs bring my perspective in the, uh, in the classroom using these instructional strategies, working one-on-one -on -one with my MESA staff, um, and also giving PD to my staff uh, to give a more personalized experience of what I've had in the classroom with these strategies. Uh, what I've really appreciated about this model is um, even though we create this professional development that's district-wide, we get to bring that uh, presentation back to our site and work with our admin to make sure that that professional development is meaningful to our specific teachers at our site, since you know the sites have different needs. Um, we have a different population of students, so uh, we've been able to tailor it to meet the needs of our students. Um, I'm really excited. We've spent a lot of time this year working on the idea building coming up next year. Um, I think it's going to really honor a lot of the hats that our teachers already wear uh, without overwhelming them with a bunch of new strategies and really spending time refining the eliciting and responding to student thinking that we've already done. So, thank you. Thank you, Stevie. It is important that we monitor our results with any program we invest in. Keeping data at the forefront of our discussions will help inform our future practices. While the work that our instructional, instructional coaches do is far-reaching, there are a few metrics that we are looking at which I'd like to share with you this evening. This last year, our math teachers implemented a new local benchmark assessment that measures procedural fluency, conceptual understanding, and the ability to communicate mathematical thinking. Knowing that eliciting and responding to student thinking is at the core of the work that our instructional coaches do, and that the ability to communicate math math mathematical thinking is really an extension of ERST, we wanted to see the growth over the year in that key area. As you can see from the numbers on the screen, our students' ability to communicate mathematical thinking has gone from 52% proficient to 70% proficient as measured by our locally developed test. It is important to note that this test is not a typical math assessment. We are moving from assessments that are simple, simply multiple choice to having students go through complex problem solving, and our benchmark is an example of that. One additional measure right now that we are examining are the results of the LPAC, of the, LPAC the annual test that all <coughs> English learners take to determine their progress towards English fluency. The LPAC is broken down into four categories, three of which direct directly relate to ERST, speaking, listening, and writing. As I shared earlier, a key population we seek to affect with our instructional coach model is our English learners and the in-classroom support that they receive. Our instructional coaches and ELD TOSAs have worked together to integrate their goals for English learners into the ERST PD sessions that our teachers have received. In looking at our data, the first row is the 2019-2020 school year when most students completed the LPAC before the huge impact on the pandemic uh, school closures hit. Our work is to meet and surpass these levels. As you can see from the chart, we are making progress in each of these areas 
and have surpa surpassed pre-COVID levels in writing. We expect the 2022-2023 data to come in soon and we will continue to examine these numbers. While we are proud of the work that our instructional coaches are doing, we are always looking to improve. This year, we will spend more time integrating the role of the instructional coaches with the secondary TOSA team that we're currently assembling. We're launching the idea building focus of eliciting and responding and our upcoming district-wide PD day on August 17th, and then continuing that work on November 1st. We will be continuing to explore with our teachers how ERST can better support our English learners. <clears throat> We will be utilizing a newer resource, professional development subs, who are going to help bolster the work that the instructional coaches are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And finally, we will continue to monitor data points in order to guide our next steps. Thank you very much for your attention and interest in our instructional coaching model. That concludes the presentation this evening. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I guess I'll have one. Trustee White. Oh, <laughs> you're not getting off that easy. <laughs> um, so, so say, uh, is there, what are the requirements to be an instructional coach, say, and how long are they an instructional to coach? And, you know, is that something that, um, is there, say, a, you know, that a process to, you know, hiring, or not even hiring, but appointing a instructional coach? And how does that all go? How Good does that question. look? So um, the process for hiring, uh, for selecting the instructional coaches is done annually um, and is left to the principals. So in fact, today I was speaking with one of our secondary principals who was um, completing that process. Um, so the principals solicit interest from their staff um, in terms of teachers that they would, teachers that would be interested in taking on that role. Um, and then the administrative team at the site goes through and um, conducts an interview and asks them about, you know, what assets <coughs> or values that they would bring to the role. And then ultimately it's uh, selected by the site principal. Got it. Awesome. Trustee Crane. Just a, a curious question is, how, how uh, large are the groups when you go and inst instruct, or is it a one-on-one -on -one where you ob observe the classroom and then you give feedback uh, later? How does that work? So it can work in, mul in multiple ways. Oh, so there are um, different ways. It, it could be on a one-on-one -on -one basis where um, one coach working with one teacher. Um, commonly, you'll see it, um, a, an instructional coach working with a group of teachers, perhaps a department. Mm. Um, and then a lot of the work that we've done has been whole staff work. Um, so, um, as, so I meet monthly with the instructional coaches and we, we map out all of this work that we're doing and we co-create um, professional developments that are aligned um, and they present those to um, staff at um, staff meeting days that are set out during the course of the year. So it looks uh, different ways okay. to serve different needs. Thank you. You got it. Trustee um, thank you for your presentation. I just had a question. The student outcomes slide where the um, ability to communicate mathematical thinking mm -hmm. went up nearly 50% um, in one year. Is that district-wide or is that from one of your site cohorts or is that from all students where... Yeah, so thank you for that question. Uh, that is district-wide uh, secondary, so 712 data. So what we're looking at in that slide is um, the progress over time uh, for the students. So what happens is we give that assessment, um, and then that assessment is broken down. Each of those problems kind of teases out different areas of mathematics, and, and one of the areas that we're looking to look into is the ability to communicate mathematical thinking. So. You know, traditionally we look at a math test and we think, okay, is it right or is it wrong? You know, we all grew up kind of getting, you know, you get seven out of 10 on a math test, but um, we work with a partner that goes through and analyzes the student work uh, deeply when they take these assessments and can tease out for us um, the, the measures that you see there. Um, but to simply answer your question, that is district-wide data. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any, oh, I have a oh, question. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about the writing for the LPAC data. I know that has um, traditionally been the harder um, area to boost, um, and of course we would want that to be higher, but I'm, I'm encouraged to see it going up. Um, what did you guys do differently this year? 
f within writing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, writing is a difficult thing for a lot of our students, and particularly for our English learners, that's the, the final domain that comes along uh, for students. Um, the focus has been on the eliciting and responding to student thinking. So the responding part of that student feedback is uh, teacher feedback to students. Um, and so um, there's uh, you know, writing conferences and there's ways that teachers engage students in a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, and so it's kind of, writing's the culmination of all of the, of all of the aspects of English language arts. Um, so knowing that those numbers are not um, obviously as high as where, as some of the other ones, it will continue to be a focus. Um, and part of the conversation that, or part of the, what you heard me say earlier is the, the cross content where we're looking at how it affects um, all of our departments. Um, writing is something that should be taking place not just in any English language arts classroom. Um, so there's a, a stronger focus in science classrooms, math classrooms, um, history, social science classrooms, um, so that writing becomes a priority across the school day and not just in, in English language arts. Wonderful, period. thank you. Oh, Trustee Bartow. I'm under Ursoilu, so if you see Ursoilu come up, that's because we switched oh, seats oh. for today. Oh, I have you under Bartow. Here. Oh, yeah. that's great. Good. Right. <laughs> Good. Um, my question is, uh, in regards to the writing and for English language learners, two questions. One, um, do we have additional strategies that we're going to employ for those students? And two, um, can you define what those EL students mean? I know we've got the longer EL. Th there's a lot of definitions that go into that, so I want to make sure that we're helping those students for where they actually are, um, and additionally to provide additional strategies, because it is it is good we're improving, but um, that writing is very important, especially for uh, at, at our, in the secondary level, so I'd love to see that improve. Yeah, and I'm happy to answer the question if you guys want to jump in, too. Um, okay. <laughs> Um, so it, I, I'm hearing two questions. Um, what is the writing that we're doing or, or what are some of the things that we're doing and then also kind of what are the levels of our, of our EELs? I'll start with the second part of that question. So um, when, we're, when we're looking at this data and we're talking about our English learners, we're talking about the, current, the students who are currently English language learners. So once a student reclassifies, they become a reclassified English language learner. Um, so we're really focusing on those kids that have not yet reclassified. And under that umbrella, there's multiple versions of that. So I think I, I heard you say something about long-term English language learners. Those are students that have been language learn, uh, English language learners for six or more years. Um, but also within that category, we have what we refer to as our newcomers. Those are students that have been in the country for you know 12 to 24 months or less than that. Um, and then there's a range of students between all of that. And so everything that we're trying to, to do to support our English learners is to support all of those students. But if you think about the variety of the students that I just mentioned, the students that have been here six years, and perhaps students that have been here six months, they have very different needs. And so the work that our multilingual learner department is doing um, this year is to really ensure that the curriculum that's put in front of kids is um, appropriate for the level that they're at. Um, and ensuring that we're um, really implementing all of the strategies that are appropriate for each of those students. Um, and so um, the additional piece to kind of connect it back to the, the first part of your question is to um, ensure that there's close alignment between the English language arts curriculum and the ELD curriculum. So it's not enough just to try to bolster their ELD or their language needs. We also need to provide them access to grade level standards um, so that we're not just trying to remediate it, that we're still keeping a high bar. And so it's through a combination of you know, very strong ELD curriculum, but also a focus on English language arts and the writing strategies in both that will hopefully uh, allow us to close that gap further. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think okay. that's it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. And next we have the consent calendar. I move to adopt the consent calendar. Okay. Moved by Trustee Crane. Can I ask you have a, a question? question? Yes. Okay. Do you, uh, uh, let's get a second and then you can ask a question. Okay, good. Second. Okay. Um, the question is just in regards to um, on the Isaac facilities use agreement. I just had a question on the payment of the rent, previous payments, if they've been up to date, if they've, if they've been able to make those. Isaac uh, generally is uh, 
pays on time, although uh, they're a bit behind right now. They're uh, behind March through June. So from March to June? Yes. Like multiple months? Yes. So what do we do if they continue not to pay? Well, um, we, um, there's a number of options there. Um, they've, they've been responsive in the past when they've gotten behind. And um, of course, there's always, um, uh, we provide them with in lieu property taxes. So we could always withhold those uh, as, a, as a balancer. At what point can we terminate the lease? Can we at all? I mean, is there any kind of level of recourse in that regard? Uh, not really for payment issues, no. Any idea on maybe why they're not making the payments, Jeff? Um, it, it's, it's just, um, I, I just think they, they have issues with staffing and those kinds of things. It's a staff issue. My, my sur surmising. Thanks. Okay. Any additional questions? Okay. So it's moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Weigand. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Weigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Next is our discussion action calendar, 17A. Approve the 2023-24 Declaration of Need for Fully Qualified Educators. Ms. Olson. Thank you. Tonight we bring forward to you, this is an annual document required uh, by the state of a Declaration of Need for Fully Qualified Educators. And what it does is it articulates the anticipated need for in cases where we do not have people who are fully qualified. So this document addresses three areas. It is um, emergency permits. Uh, we use very few of those. Most people have them coming in, so you'll see the number on that is very low. Um, limited assignment permits, you might look at that and um, say it looks a little higher than last year, and that is because the form itself has changed. So in the past, for a limited um, term assignment, we would only have to state how many we would need to use, and we usually went about 15, somewhere in there is what we would say in, in anticipation. Now we have to list it by, cat by credential, mm -hmm. subject specific, so just that alone, being that specific, is going to add because of the number of different types it could be. Um, it also addresses intern, inter, any intern permits that we would use. Again, the reason why the numbers look higher than they have been in the past is, one, the way the form is, and the second is, is that if we are 10% over what we need, we have to resubmit to the state and wait for it to be approved before we could hire someone. And 10% of two, um, we're talking very small numbers, and so that's why those numbers might look a little bit larger. So we ask that the board approve our declaration. So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Weigand. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Weigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Okay. Next up, we have 17B. Haley Jenkins, if you'd like to make your comment now. Hello, Superintendent Smith, President Anderson, and members of the board. Um, just commenting tonight on Superintendent Smith's contract extension to June 2027. Now, I know you already gave him a positive evaluation from this school year, and no doubt you'll vote 7 nothing in favor of extending the contract. But I just have to ask, and I know you can't answer me, but what would a superintendent have to do to get an unfavorable evaluation? Under Superintendent Smith's time here, we've spent way more on students than almost any other local district, while test scores have continued to go down. 22% of 10th graders were meeting reading benchmarks. 22%. Okay. 
that graduation rates are still high, which is curious, and especially after I just saw what that presentation was about. Extremely expensive social emotional learning programs have been implemented without parent approval, resulting in a legal letter from Dillon Law. Chronic absenteeism is to 25%. Gender transitions are occurring without parental knowledge. We have more admin staff under his watch while student enrollment drops. Racial disparities are continuing to grow, specifically among English learners, and our fiscal health is at the bottom. But tonight, you will vote to extend his contract to 2027. So I know it takes a lot of courage to step out of the crowd and vote no, and it likely won't happen, but just for a moment, I want you to imagine what would it look like if you didn't hire someone straight from Sacramento that follows all the advice of Newsom and Tony Thurman and Scott Weiner, and you took the time to research and hire a true leader, someone that isn't just jolly and attends a lot of school events and makes funny jokes, but someone that will actually make hard choices and turn this district around. Just imagine if you gave someone that chance instead of extending failure. Please let that sit with you when you vote to extend his contract. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Okay, moved by Trustee uh, Ursulu, seconded by Trustee Pearson. Pearson. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Next, 17C, adopt resolution 010723, education protection account expenditure determination. Mr. Trader. In uh, 2012, the voters approved Proposition 30, which created the education protection account. We received funding in this regard, 3.8 million, and tonight we are certifying that we use that for instructional purposes, not administration. Okay. Thank you, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Wigand. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Okay, next we have 17D, the first reading and adoption of modifications to board policy. Rebecca Sinclair. Um, thank you so much, Superintendent Smith, President Anderson, and the Board of Trustees. Please excuse my attire right now. <laughs> I am the picture of a very busy mom of four kids enjoying summer break. Um, I think I still have sand on my uh, sandals, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm here tonight to ask you to please consider delaying the adoption of Board Policy 5020. Um, I, um, in my school community, we absolutely love our school. We love our teachers, we love our principal, um, and I have many friends in the community who also care deeply about parental rights and transparency. And I think it's out of respect for those community members who truly care about these issues to follow the procedure of moving to a second reading to genuinely solicit community feedback and then going to a vote. Um, again, bathing suit still on. It's a busy time of year to kind of pull out from summer break and to think clearly about parental rights and, tr and genuinely how the parent-teacher-administrator relationship looks like in school. And so I think it's a rough time of year to do this. And I know you've been so responsive to my questions via email, and I thank you for that. Um, I'd love to also provide more feedback to the policy editing committee if given the opportunity. And I know I also have friends in my community who would love to do that as well. So please consider it. Um, it's out of respect for your parents. There's nothing more that we want to see more than our schools succeed and for these home school relationships to truly thrive. Thanks. Thank you. Reina Shabasta.
Good evening. Thank you for having me. Uh, I want to start with saying a thank you to Trustee Bardo for attempting, in her words, to push for a board policy to explicitly address making parental rights and transparency at the forefront of parent and teacher interactions, as was stated on social media on March 19th, following the media coverage of the district's secrecy policy related to gender social transitions. According to the description, quote, it is recommended that the Board of Education accept the recommendation of the board's policy editing team to conduct this first reading, waive the second reading, and adopt the revisions to the policy 5020, parent rights and responsibilities. However, according to Ed Code, each governing board of a school district shall, shall develop jointly with parents and guardians and sh shall adopt a policy that outlines the manner in which parents or guardians of pupils, school staff, and pupils may share the responsibility for continuing the intellectual, physical, emotional, and social development and well-being of pupils. Please do not ignore the collaborative process and the most important role of parents in the, de in the development of policy pertaining to parents' rights and responsibilities. Rights of parents must be respected, honored, and protected in our nation's great schools. I request that you defer adoption until parents jointly develop an amended policy 5020 to align with the Chino Valley Unified School District Model California Parent Notification Policy. This policy requires educators to promptly notify parents about important facts and circumstances involving their child's health and well-being on public school campuses. The CVUSD policy has been legally vetted and approved by several respected organizations. Parents are not public enemy, they are an ally. As I begin my 24th year as a public school counselor and am a parent of, of two NMUSD students, I am clear on the distinction and the crucial need for parents' rights and interests for our children to be prioritized. Thank you. Okay, next is Haley Jenkins. In reference to your policy 5020, Parents' Rights and Responsibilities, I have to urge you to keep working on this. Do not vote tonight to adopt these policy amendments. This specifically discusses the rights of parents who were not even jointly involved in the development of this, like they should have been, and is required by California Ed Code. And you're choosing to present this and vote on it without a second reading while many parents are out of town as it's summertime. A parent's policy without parents. Now, I want to thank, just as Raina did, Trustee Bartow for stating on your social media that you were going to try to push for the board policy to address making parental rights and uh, transparency at the forefront. But this does none of that. I'm not sure where you all started with um, and broke it down to this final thing, but you basically could have just stayed home the last few months and done nothing, and our rights would still be the same, because your policy is just word for word ed code. These rights already exist. It's like saying we have the right to send our kids to school with a backpack. Did you hear the good news? We have the right to speak to our child's teacher. This is nothing new. Parents should not be an afterthought. Their authority is essential. And in Superintendent Smith's words, he wants to make sure every child is seen, heard, valued, and safe. And this won't happen when parents are kept pushed to the side. Chino Valley Unified just passed a landmark, legally vetted parent policy that seeks to restore trust between parents in the district and explicitly bring parents into the decision-making process in regards to children's mental health and social-emotional issues. Two board members sitting before me told me that our legal counsel is errs on the side of not informing parents. So that's a problem for all of us and will likely be for you in the future if kids are harmed by these policies. So I urge you to go back to the drawing board, jointly work with parents on the development of a parent rights policy, and align this with something similar to Chino Valley that actually seeks to involve parents in the educational care and upbringing of their children. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Portia Fisher. Hello again. Um, I just also would like to um, echo that, that I'd like you to postpone. I've been a teacher for over 30 years, and for the majority of it, I've worked at a cooperative um, where parents are very present, and we're 100% transparent, and I love that. I never want to work in any other situation. I think it makes me a better teacher, because I'm always intentional and always accountable. And 
I'm not asking the district to completely change and become a cooperative. My experience with my children in the district was wonderful as well because my children were on a campus where I was welcome and I was there and I was a part of it and even asked, I mean, school site council chairman, PTA president, all of that aside, even on my daily basis walking on the campus, the teachers engaged with me and asked me. And I know there are good teachers that still wanna do that. And I know there are great parents that still want to do that. And you can't change a narrative because of a couple bad parents, just like you don't want to change it for a couple bad teachers. So I really would ask that you go back to the drawing board, go beyond what's stated there, and put the parents first. Because without the parents, you lose the good ones. And then you lose those kids. If you want to stay strong, you need us. So that's my request. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Wendy Boyd. Hi, my name is Wendy Boyd, and thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. I basically want to just um, uh, confirm and to support the two, three, um, previous people that spoke tonight, and highly recommend that you take the model from Chino Valley as your, um, uh, you know, one to, to follow and to, to hold off on making any kind of decision tonight um, and do more groundwork and, and preparation for this very important um, parent rights and uh, transparency. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy Lees. I heard a motion in the making. Wendy, please. Good evening again. One thing I learned when I was on the city council, it was kind of embarrassing the hard way. I learned not to make up my mind before I listened to public comments, which you're doing right now. So I hope none of you have made up your mind that you're going to just pass this on the first reading because this community has a lot to say about uh, parent rights. The proposed policy needs to clearly address parental notification of their child's request to be identified or treated as a gender other than the biological sex or gender listed on the student's birth certificate or another official record. Yes, any parent would be upset uh, if they found out that their child is at school telling the counselor and the teacher that they want to become a different gender. I got upset at my five kids for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, some of them were doing drugs. And uh, I had a right to get upset. Parents have a right to get upset. However, what you're doing by not keeping parents in the loop is wrongly assuming that an upset parents, it, parent is going to be abusive. Not because a parent has a right not to agree with the decision that their minor child under 18 is making that may put them at risk for uh, a surgery that is going to be harmful to them. And uh, what if uh, you'd keep it a secret from the parents and that child does commit suicide and the school knew you could be sued? So it's not rocket science to add parent notification, just like Chino has done, uh, because what they basically, if you read their policy, they give three days to notify the parent. You have that time to figure out how to approach the parent. If the parent is abusive, then as mandated reporters, your teachers, your counselors, everybody needs to file a CPS report, and that's their duty. Thank you. Lynn Riddle. Excuse me, I have to put my glasses on. Uh, good evening. I am Lynn Riddle, a resident of the city. Um, and with due respect, I take a different view and tell this board, well done. I came to personally deliver my respect and my gratitude to the board's policy committee, along with the district admins and legal counsel, that working together you've done a masterful job, in my view, 
with proposed policy 5020. I'm guessing, being thoughtful representatives of the varying areas that you represent, you began with some differing views, yet it's clear that the policy that you've articulated, coming as it has through your collaborative efforts, is precisely what is needed at this moment. Your effort and policy is a model of democratic school governance. You're honorably, you've honorably compromised by keeping your principal goal the education of all of the children in this district as your North Star. Second, public schools, publicly financed schools. There's a lot of turmoil of late, roiling parental fear and accusations that our public school teachers, counselors, administrators are wrongfully um, intruding themselves into relationships between parents and their children, that schools are taking away parental rights to direct the education of their children. But I would like to remind you that public education is not intended to teach or to encourage that children be the clones of or the chattel of their parents. No, those, or our, those children, our students, are being prepared to make their own way in an increasingly complex world. As I see it, the public schools greatest duty is to provide each child with fundamental skills to navigate, thrive, and to contribute, each in their own way, uh, to, the, to a society that's quite different. Thank you. And let me just remind you, if I might, that students We're out also of time, I'm sorry. Have Excuse me, that is unacceptable. I have asked her to stop. It is unacceptable for the audience to harass or bother people at when they're speaking. It's not okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Very thank much. you. Do we have a motion? Um, I have a motion. Um, I have a motion to amend the proposed policy um, with some items. Um, so for the um, passive language, have access, um, may, I would like to amend that to more affirmative language with will provide, for example, um, on points one, two, three, five, seven, eight, and nine. Wait, and then, can, can you um, slow down, Michelle, sure. and repeat? Um, I would like to amend items one, two, three, five, seven, eight, and nine to provide more affirmative language. So instead of have access to, um, for example, are provided with, um, something that puts the um, responsibility on, uh, not on the parents to search it out, but to um, go and have it provided to them. Um, additionally, I'd like to add two points, um, a 10 and 11, um, and these are from the Chino Valley policy, which um, you guys are welcome to look at. I printed them out if you like. You do, okay. For everyone, I do, yeah. And they are regarding um, principals, guardians, certificated staff, and school counselors shall notify the parents, guardians, in writing within three days from the date any district employee, administrator, or certificated staff becomes aware that a student is requesting to be identified or treated as a gender defined in Ed Code Section 2210.7, other than the student's biological sex or gender listed on the student's birth certificate or any other official records. This includes any request by the student to use a name that differs from their legal name, or other than a commonly recognized diminutive of the child's legal name, or to use pronouns that do not align with the student's biological sex or gender listed on the student's birth certificate or other official records, accessing sex segregated school programs and activities, including athletic teams and competitions, or using bathrooms or changing facilities that do not align with the student's biological sex or gender listed on the birth certificate or other official records, requesting to change any information contained in the student's official or unofficial records. Item 11, the principal, guardian, or staff shall notify the parents, guardians of the student immediately or as soon as reasonably possible that the student has experienced any significant physical injury while on school property or participating in a school-sponsored activity. All district employees shall take every student's statement regarding suicidal intent seriously. 
A, whenever an employee, administrator, or certificated staff member suspects or has knowledge of a student's suicidal intentions based on the student's verbalizations or act of self-harm, the employee, administrator, or staff member shall promptly notify the principal or school counselor who shall implement district's intervention protocols as appropriate and shall notify the parent, guardian immediately or as soon as reasonably possible. Uh, B, when a suicide attempt or threat is known, the principal or designee shall ensure student safety by taking the following actions. One, uh, immediately secure medical treatment and our mental health services as necessary. Two, keep the student under continuous adult supervision until the parent, guardian, and or appropriate support agent or agency can be contacted and has the opportunity to intervene. Three, notify law enforcement and other emergency assistance if a suicidal act is being actively threatened and remove other students from the area in the event of an active suicidal act. C, the principal or designee shall document the incident in writing, including the steps that the school took in response to the suicide attempt or threat. D, school employees shall act only with the authorization and scope of their credential or license. An employee is not authorized to diagnose or treat mental illness unless specifically licensed and employed to do so. The rest of the policy would remain the same. Um, is there, before we move to questions, do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, then we can discuss. Um, Trustee, can I? Hmm? Trustee Barto, is there a reason why we didn't get this ahead of time so we can think about it a little more? Um, I had to think about it a little more. Are you, really? Okay. Any additional questions or comments? So. Okay. Call for the question. So moved. Oh. Trustee Anderson? No. Trustee Crane? No. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? No. Trustee Ursoilu? No. Trustee Barto? Yes. I'd like to move to. Um, oh. oh. Did you want to make the motion? Yep. Oh, go ahead. Trustee um, Murphy. I appreciate actually all of your hard work on this. Um, and I certainly appreciate on the list number 11 in terms of the suicidal and injury um, statements and spelling out policy and procedures about how that would be handled. Um, I think that's extraordinarily important and probably better that we have it spelled out. I don't know that I've seen it anywhere necessarily else. Um, it probably is, but um, but I like I like how that part about taking care of a student who might be suicidal is written. So I would move that we add 11. And I would second that if we can make a motion. Yeah. The one thing that I think, too, is so um, to discuss the items. I appreciate you doing this as well. The items, these two items specifically, um, are more administrative regulations than they are policies. And so I think some other districts may not know the difference. Um, but when we're giving direction as to how a school site operates and what is happening on a campus, it's a little bit different than having a policy. So we can include something around mental health, but like all of the information that's on that page is an administrative regulation, not a policy. Okay. On which page, on this particular? On number 11, 11. Right? it goes into the second page. Where do we talk about and where is it spelled out that we keep and notify parents of su suicidal, um, any kind of suicidal tendencies or anything well, like that? That's we're mandated reporters, right? I, I mean, teachers are mandated reporters. I think they, yeah. it's part of their, hmm? Dr. Choice. Um, yeah, I think one of the things we could evaluate is we do have other policies that are in our student services division um, that do address suicide. Um, and we adopted those probably uh, probably 2017, 18 school years back then. Uh, we could take a look at that and evaluate what it says on student suicides and, and in particular, 
uh, to your comments, a parental notification. So just uh, for clarification then, um, just to follow up on yours is if, if a student has suicidal ideation and shares it with a teacher, the teacher is, is a mandated reporter and reports it to the administration, right? No. Or is there a... So there's a practice in place when we have students who have issues at our school site that's procedural on our campuses that, in, that integrates both counselors, administrators, and at times uh, medical services, um, emergency response teams and things like that. If a student's in danger or his safety is compromised, then Child Protective Services is a vehicle for that. Mm. But when we look at suicide response for students who are in crisis and we've done threat assessments, we have an integrative approach which brings those professionals together to make a decision, professionals on campus, to go forward and, and move forward to, to make sure the student's safe and isn't going to have potential self-harm. In that is parent discussion. So in that, parents are notified. The only time we would not do that is if we felt like the student was in danger of their family and we work that out with the student. But our process right now is Parents are involved in that process, and it is done through the office, through threat assessments, to determine exactly what the needs of that student are. And can you explain to me AR and what that is and how that, um, how these two, 10 and 11, would be more of an AR than a parental rights policy? You're asking? A or anyone? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the administrative regulations are, are the small p policies and practices. How do we take the board's uh, board policies and then operationalize those? And those are developed by staff with staff to make sure that we can, um, you know, respect the rights of all those employee groups and others that are there as we serve our students, their safety and their well-being. So administrative regulations are established by the administration to support board policies. And then I have a follow-up question yeah. to that. Do we, um, I know it was mentioned earlier, we actually, other boards don't do this this way, but we have a specific <coughs> parental notification policy that is different than our parents' rights policy. Um, as part of our registration that is going to be happening soon, is there something or could there be something on there as part of the notifications? Um, since that is our primary way of informing parents and getting consent at the beginning of each school year, would it be possible or do we already have something in place about mental health, about suicidal ideation? And, and you're specifically speaking about suicidal ideations and mental health. I just wanted to be clear before we answer that. Yes. Um, Dr. Jockham? We do have a, a board policy, 5141.52, and it does indicate that... Um, um, the parents are, shall be notified um, if their child has um, a, an incident in terms of um, suicidal ideation or there's a crisis assessment, a risk assessment done for their child. Mm -hmm. So that is in existing board policy right now. Okay. How does the difference between shall and will? It, that's, those terms are synonymous okay. in, in policy. In policy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I was just going to answer your question because we went off of, I, I think the question was, can we do more to bolster our, our um, registration packets, et cetera? And of course, of course, we can work on that as well. Okay. Trustee Ursulu? Yeah, I think I'm going to revamp my previous when I pressed the buzzer. I had a different comment. But um, now that, thank you, Dr. Jokum, for sharing that we have 5141.52. If that policy already exists, then... Um, I would like to un unsupport. <laughs> I know. I was like, <laughs> my, I back? Amen. my, Amen. my Amen. second. Amen. Yeah. And so I think that that's another place that um, I'd like to suggest that um, the policy review committee review 5141.52 in light of the Chino Valley one and maybe bring something like that in the future. But for tonight, for what we're doing on this policy, 5020. Um, I, I want to undo my, my seconding of... <laughs> and I would be in support of that, too. It would be good to take a look at 5141. Yeah. 5141. Five, one, we'll five, call two. for the questions. Yeah, then there's any. And then does everyone vote? Yeah. Okay. Rosie? <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> Sorry. 
Do you want to amend it or do you want to start over? That's, I don't know if you heard me about amending it or so, we can let it fall. We can let it fall. Okay. We'll just bring it back up with the next with the next review, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So don't vote. We'll Trustee call. Anderson. Uh. No. Yeah. We are killing. Uh, an <laughs> yeah. So it's a no. <laughs> so Trustee Crane, no. Trustee Wigand. Uh, no, because. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Trustee Pearson. No. Trustee Murphy. No. Trustee Ursoilu? No. Trustee Barto? No. Okay. Do you want to make a motion on the existing? I'll make a motion to pass the existing okay. proposed. Second. Okay. Moved by Trustee Murphy, seconded by Trustee Ursulu. Do we have discussion? Um, I have a just question, and it can it yeah. kind of go in any point in this discussion. Um, but can you? talk about how the uh, administrative regulations are developed and how um, the board members know when they're um, amended? Yeah, once we've considered an administrative regulation and take it out of draft form, um, it is then adopted at the cabinet level and then we share that with the board um, officially. No administrative regulations for these have been finalized because we're waiting to hear the board's direction on 5020 before we move forward. So you can expect that shortly. Okay. Uh, Trustee Crane. I have a, a grammatical suggestion. Um, Number three, where it says have access to your child's school and classroom as, as a visitor. Uh, we should use the word there so we're consistent with the language that follows mm -hmm. instead of your child. Mm -hmm. And would you need to put instead of child student or do you want to keep it as child? I mean, it's either or. Those are small changes, so. All right, yeah. I just think um, grammatically. Sure, okay. Did someone make, did you want to make I, a substitution? <laughs> yeah, I, I, there was some um, changes that I think Trustee Barto um, also asked. It was um, one through nine that we use um, will or shall instead of may on some of these, um, like number two, uh, have will um, provide the, uh, will, will, or shall examine the curriculum materials of the class or classes in which the student is enrolled. Um, and then three, will be uh, provided with access to your child's school and classrooms to be able to observe instruction in classroom settings and displays. Okay, I believe our discussion had been that parents have the option to do these rather than we're forcing them to do them as parental rights are parental rights. So when we're asking some, when we're saying words like will and shall, it's an option that people have. It's not, this isn't something necessarily we're enforcing. So it's kind of a tricky one for this specifically that we discussed. I guess it's just, more discussion I just want to make sure that no parent is turned away from doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why if I'm looking at it, if it says may examine, is that may because they have the option or is it may because that particular classroom does not want that to happen? Yeah, and what is the process with, with teachers to understand that? Yeah, two things, a point of clarification. I, First and a second discussion can't really make edits, even grammatical edits, because the motion is for as written, mm -hmm. the policy is written. Oh. So this okay. conversation um, uh, really can't be a part of those first and, and the second. Um, but to answer the question, uh, we absolutely wouldn't deny access. Uh, if, if there were 10 parents that day that came in, for example, to see the same classroom, the principal would say, Let's do that in a different day. I, I think the shall uh, is is problematic in that parent shall. Now you're comparing pa parents to go look at the policy or to go look at the classroom. What if parents don't want to go look? What if they say, I trust what my school's doing. I, my kid's doing really, really well. I don't want to go in there. So shalling them, they shall do something. 
as opposed to they have a right, which is what this says. Every parent in this district has a right to all of those things enumerated on that policy. Um, that's, that's what it says technically. And I think, but that being said, the board has every right to let this motion fail and go back to that conversation. But what you have in front of you now is a motion in a second to approve it as written, just, just for a point of clarification. But I, ho I hope that uh, Trustee Wagon helps with the question you were asking, though. Yeah. Whether or not this. Yeah, goes I just want to make sure that the way it's written in this, it, that parents have the option sh should they choose to go in and see and you know observe and and like I think one of our um, comments before, like they were able to go in and be on campus and everything like that. I just want to make sure that that is what we're able to do for our parents. Yeah, absolutely, it's right. Parents have to be to be there to volunteer. Again, there are certain provisions, right? right. Mm -hmm. If a parent. Um, has a record, so they can't be on campus, and they have no right to be there. So mm -hmm. excluding those kinds of things, um, then, then yes, of course, to volunteer to be in the classroom to see what's happening there, to see the content, um, et cetera, enumerated in, in these items. That's right. Um, and I just, I wanted to make um, a point, because this had been raised um, by a few people, but this, um, the. We did, we did follow the California Ed Code pretty um, strictly, as is the role of board policy. Um, and this is an update. This is not a first policy. So some districts don't have a parental rights and responsibilities policy. We have had one since at least 2009. That was the last time it was updated. I don't know when it was created. So. The language that talks about the parents being involved in the de development of the policy already happened over a decade ago. So the board, particularly our newly elected people, are representative of their community and are in this role, have the power and the authority to create and amend policy. It's different than administrative regulations. Um, it's different than creating a brand new policy. Every board in the state of California is in different places. Some people have policies about certain things. There was one at one point about, um, you know, the polls at Estancia and having notification in the community. There's things that are very different in different districts. So we are updating this policy with these proposed changes. It's not a new policy, so we don't go out and ask for feedback. The board meeting, which we have monthly, is the opportunity for parents and community members to give input and feedback. Did you have a comment, Trustee Crane? Yeah, was, they may have it before Oh, I, I had one, too. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, I just, I guess my, I understand what uh, Trustee uh, Bartow and Wigan are trying to say with the shall. I get nervous about shall, meaning we'd have to send out curriculum to everybody and the expense of that, um, considering that you could like have your kid bring their books home and, and go through it all you want. Um, so I have a problem, I think, with that shall, especially with number one, um, though I certainly understand your intent and, um, and applaud it and, um, and think you're right. And, um, and I do know that I, I've been on my kids campus many, many, many times. The thing that always holds me back, I think, on the volunteering is the TB shot. I think that's what it is. It's one of those. But um, uh, but I always have felt very welcome on every campus my students have attended. And I have known that I can talk to my te their teachers. And certainly my son has an aide. And I get lots of access to all of their information. So I would never um, not agree with you on that, that how important that is. So um, that's my comment on that. And then I guess I'm rescinding my latest motion. Is that two <laughs> failed motions? <laughs> Which one? Is that what I'm doing now? Because we want to change the uh, grammar the on grammar. that, on that? Yes. We can't change, we can't. That's up to you. <laughs> okay. But if you want to change the grammar in that item, then yes, you'd have to make another motion if you agreed that that was a material change to the policy. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, now. And did Trustee Ursula wanted to say yeah, something? Yeah, back to the may, shall, all the, <laughs> all the words. Um, so of the nine elements, um, only three of them say may. And the ones that say may are the ones that are responsibilities. The other six are rights. So those are the more, um, 
I don't know what you call them, active verbs. Um, the you, you know, opt out, are able, um, have access. So those are the ones that are your, you know, ultimate responsibilities, right? Um, your rights, sorry. And then the responsibilities are the ones that you may go do. You may go review it, you may do this. We just facilitate your ability to do that, but we can't mandate that in a shall because that's your responsibility. You might not choose to use your responsibility, but your rights are concrete and in the active voice. So I think that's just a, the grammatical differentiation between those nine elements. Um, but if that clarifies it for anybody. I think that's helpful. I had one little thing to add, um, I guess while we're between motions. Um, for examining the <coughs> curriculum, can I ask and I, that we come up with a way to communicate how to add, get to the curriculum to parents, whether that's in the um, do registration document that we come through when we're new parents or something that mm. just says, you know, we all, get, we all get those 8, 9, 10, 11 pages that we have to go through um, at registration and Don't just you read every word <laughs> <laughs> the first couple of years I did and once I got to high school and different school levels I really did um, even while we were driving through uh, like uh, Lassen and there was no cell service and anyways um, mm -hmm. but the um, it feels like we could put in a page in all of those documentations that say here's how you access the curriculum here's where the online links are and if people choose not to go to them I mean that falls within the rights should they choose to exercise them, but just making that a little clearer for people, I think, um, is, is an effort towards transparency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I wanted to come back while we're having the discussion before we see where this vote lands. <laughs> Thrilling TV. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Trustee Barto was mentioning you know, the ARs, and, and I just want, didn't want this to get left out. I answered the technical part of the question. Um, what, what I would also say, though, is, is that we work to make sure that state and federal laws are upheld, right? That student safety um, is, above all else, uh, our priority. We've also heard from this community about their desire to be informed, and we've heard from trustees of this dais talk about that same thing. Um, we've, we've stated here publicly in response to other um, public comments um, about our data, where we are, uh, how we prioritize things in this district. We've said it right here. People can go back and review that. So that is informing the process. Um, there is no, uh, I, it was called secrecy policy. I, I searched that one, can't find it. Um, but the AR that we're working on related to specifically your question, Trustee Barto, I think is absolutely a demonstration of listening to our public inform this process. And I think the people out there watching and maybe some of the people in the room uh, will hold out their judgment until they see that. And then if they have issue, can certainly come to staff and, and tell us where, where we didn't listen. But, but a lot has been set up here over the months. Uh, a lot of commitments have been made. Those will continue to be made. Uh, in that process that you asked me about. Thank you. I want to say one more. Yes, Trustee Green. Yeah, and I, and I wanted to speak to the culture uh, of our board and our district as it relates to one of our main priorities, which is meaningful parent engagement. We, we have, we understand that parents are absolutely the part of the formula, it's our part of a, the formula of a successful student. And we welcome our parents and involve them in many ways, including, you know, if you if you look at the enumerated rights here, where you know they can they basically can have input on um, curriculum, they have access to review students' records, et cetera, et cetera. But not only that, we also welcome them on our campuses uh, as far as volunteerism. We have uh, a lot of representation in with our EAL community and ELAC, DLAC. We have PTAs, PFOs, foundations. We have parent-student conferences. We have a robust volunteer process uh, and, and engagement. We have school site council. We have, uh, we, we have so many vehicles for parents to be involved in our schools and come on our campuses and see the good work that our uh, kids are doing, that our students are doing, our staff is doing. So. You know, please know that we, we are, you are part of our success. And it, you are also part of our priorities. So there's really no intent in any way 
to not engage the community. And this is, this is uh, you know, board, this board policy is pretty solid in my opinion. So um, I'm, I'm very much in favor in approving this policy as stated. Okay, thank you. But I think we have to deny my motion first, add the there, yes. and then do it again, right? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add one thing um, that you reminded me of also that I think is important to this, and it, again, is not the same in every district. Um, something that was important to this board and that we added to our LCAP, which is our local control and accountability plan, is we added a fourth goal of family and community engagement. It was recommended that we make that involvement or that we, we just include that as a wraparound in some of our other areas. This board decided that it was extremely important that we were putting money and programs and effort to family and community engagement. Um, so I think that further bolsters what you were saying with all of the opportunities that we have for district parents to be involved in decision making and as a part of our district programs. Um, did you want to make a new motion? Do you want to do a second reading? What would you like? Do a, what, what do I do? Do you like to amend your motion? A okay. I, I okay. want to make a substitutionary motion to amend my motion. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's okay. <laughs> we get it. You need, I need your, I need Michelle's school of, of okay. trustiness. Yes, yeah, so for only the there? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Any other questions, discussions? I just again want to also reemphasize we are a very diverse board and I really respect and appreciate that we can have these conversations that in other places are not civil. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important for our community. I think it's important for making the best decisions. So thank you to all of you for that. Would you please um, do roll call vote? Thank you. Order, is this the first can, that, can she speak? Yes. Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? No. Trustee Pearson? No. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto? No. Thank you. And next we have... In formal reports, Dr. Smith. I want to um, once again uh, agree with our labor leaders when they presented how many of our folks are around the district when they say you get summers off, they've never been on one of our campuses or facilities before. Um, we've had 4,000 students at summer school and some of you have been around and seen our teachers, our classified staff, our, our local partners providing summer school extended learning opportunities to more students than most districts in California have, period. That's, that's the kind of work that moves the needle. In the morning, they've had core content, doing things differently though, it's not more of the same, students don't learn doing that over the summer, but it is around core learning, and then enrichment and engagement in the afternoon, powerful, powerful stuff. Um, at the secondary level, credit recovery is alive and well, and bridge programs. So at the Estancia Bridge Program, where eighth grade students going into ninth grade, um, learning some of their pathways, totally, totally engaged. We've had some trustees uh, recommend that we look at bridge programs from elementary into middle. Great idea, right? Great idea. And that's the kind of thing we can do over the summer. Um, I just really can't thank our team enough for everyone involved for the exceptional learning opportunities our students are having. They're getting fed, they're being active, they're, they're, they're well, um, and that's because of the investment this board has made. And then I'll share this with you, but Christy sent it over to me today. Um, we have our summer showcases starting, I think, July 27th. I would bring a fan, um, maybe something to pat your head with, and be prepared to cheer because they are amazing and would invite you to get to as many of them in your zone or others as you can. We went last year, and besides 
sweating. Sweating. <laughs> um, uh, they were amazing. They were amazing what the kids are doing. So um, thank you. Kudos to everybody involved in that expanded learning in Newport Mesa Unified. Okay. We will start at the far end with Trustee Ursulu. Nothing to report. Thank you. Yep. Other than writing policies in my spare time, no report. Thank you. Trustee Murphy? Um, not really a report, but just uh, to echo your comments, I really appreciate our board. I appreciate working with everyone. I appreciate all of our different op opinions and our ability to come together and do what's right for the kids. I know that's what we all have in our hearts, that what we want to do and make the best of. So thank you, everyone, for just a lovely discussion tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I did all that. Mm -hmm. um, and I also was able to go visit the summer school um, programs. We were able to go, um, Trustee Crane and myself went and visited um, Harbor View Elementary and Mariners Elementary. Um, and what a, what an incredible program. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to stay. The amount of dancing, music, Lego building that we <laughs> saw going on in the classrooms was just it was, it was so much fun. I came home and anyone who had a child in our district that didn't have their kids in summer school, I was questioning them on why not. It was eight to, it's an eight to four o'clock program um, for free and these kids are getting that socialization that they have missed during COVID, um, no doubt. Um, we got to meet the new principal, um, Antoinette Coe at Mariners and she was an instant friend and she is going to um, fit right into that Mariners family. Um, I also got to go see the Fiddler on the Roof um, performance at CDM, and it was amazing what these kids are doing. Um, the, the district is doing such amazing stuff from when my kids were there. I ran thinking that I needed to be on this board uh, because I needed to fix something or I needed to step in. The education that the kids are getting now from when my kids were there is quadruple what my kids got to go through. And it is amazing. And it's because of um, Dr. Smith, because of our board, because of our teachers and administration. So um, you need to be in our schools to see what amazing things are happening. Um, I feel like I got to do so much, so many other things. Oh, I got to meet the CDM administration um, yesterday and sit down with them. And again, they um, are just putting together a plan that is just going to make CDM rock. It's, it's fantastic. And um, welcome to Dr. Kwong and Dr. Singh, um, I think. Um, they were amazing. And again, they're going to fit right in, and the CDM community is going to love them. So thank you. Um, I uh, just want to make a comment on the Harper Assessment Center Park. Um, I know that from the community, we've heard a lot about keeping that having green space and having it open. And I do know that we've worked a lot with the community, the city council and the city manager on trying to make sure that that park is accessible in that off hours when the kids are not at school and then still protecting our students um, when they are on campus. Um, so I think we've come to a, a pretty good resolution. We do have a city um, liaison meeting on Friday with the uh, city of Costa Mesa. Um, and that should be um, a pretty good uh, meeting to discuss. We all want green space in our area we all want people to use it, but we need to all use it respectfully and um, respect the space for our, for our students as well. So that has come, and I believe, you know, with the good um, cohesive working that we have, not only as a board, so thank you for tonight's discussion. Um, uh, it, uh, you know, we're, we're, mo we're moving in the right direction, I believe, you know. I mean, I might have voted a different way, but um, I want to say thank you for the discussion, and we'll move forward. Yeah, I want to ditto the sentiment of, of our board being cohesive, thus to, uh, in, in, in addition to being diverse, because we put a lot of, we, we have good discussion, but we also have different lenses, and that makes for good policy in the long run. So thank you all again. Um, so uh, we know it's summer when you start seeing construction trucks and all kinds of maintenance trucks on campuses. And uh, I live in the East Bluff neighborhood, and I, you have seen the HVACs being <laughs> HVAC being <laughs> fixed at East Bluff Elementary. Uh, we had the city and the district fixing sidewalks and make, putting uh, plant, planters around CDM. So it's kind of exciting because, you know, when the kids aren't there, you, you do the work. 
So, but even actually, when we were at Mariners, there was work being done, and I wanted to actually uh, compliment MNO because they worked around the kids' schedule <laughs> to dig the trenches. Because when we went to visit Trustee Pearson and I, uh, they were digging trenches, and then recess came, and so the, all the adults on the construction management team just kind of moved away, took a break, and then the kids took over the, the, the playground, and then recess was done, <coughs> construction came back, and you know, it's just like clockwork. So, good job, MNO. Uh, as Trustee Pearson mentioned, we're, we've been kind of each other's shadow. Went to the uh, visited Harbor View and and uh, Mariners. Kids are just having a great time. The socialization aspect of it is specifically they're happy, they're learning, they're learning how to interact with each other, and and of course the learning that's going on uh, academically as well. Um, for me, it was, I was focusing on the newcomer class at Harbor View. Thank you again, district, for supporting the newcomers. Um, it's uh, it's going to really going to help the teachers, the kids, and the families when they start in the fall. And we went and saw Fiddler on the Roof, which was an East Bluff Community th Theater. There are about 80 kids in the play, full house, three nights in a row. How exciting for kids to be engaged in learning once again. And you know, stars are born on that stage. I know it. <laughs> there was at least two that we saw. <laughs> Very cute. Uh, and we went. Uh, some of us went to the State of the County at the Bobo Bay Club, and we the guest speakers were uh, Supervisor Wagner Foley and CEO of Orange County uh, Frank Kim, I believe. And it was a good discussion. And uh, you know, we need to be out there and listen to what's going on, the projections, the trends, and also mingle and network. And so we were there, and it was a great, uh, a great thing for Newport Mesa to be there and engage with the community, because that's part of our job. So everyone else, enjoy the rest of summer, and uh, thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to say, I think that I heard from our board that we would like to make sure that there is um, maybe a new um, or updated list for parental notifications as part of registration, which I think opens in two weeks. So I don't know if that would be possible. That would be excellent. I'm really excited about new principals. I think that is wonderful. Um, I'm excited for our Estancia zone to get some folks. Um, and so I am very excited to get to know them more. And I've also been working on the playground use as parks. Um, and if anyone wants to help with that process who lives in Costa Mesa and may not know, after 4 p.m., our parks become city property. On the weekends, they become city property. On intercession breaks, summertime, when we're not using them, they become city property. Um, and so we have been working hard with the city to remind them of that and help us create a plan, um, particularly for our neighborhoods that don't have any green spaces. So please send comments to our city council. Um, that is all. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> <Not here. laughs>